Let me begin with a quote that captures much of the course of my academic and professional life. And it's from a late 1900s German mystical poet, one of my favorite, by Rilke. I live my life in widening rings, the last ring, I doubt, as it wanders over and across things, if I shall ever complete. Biopsychology is just that. It's a blend of both disciplines. It investigates things like hormones and neurotransmitters, brain processes, genetic, receptor mechanisms that underlie and we think influence a great deal of human behavior. I'm an experimental psychologist. I work in a lab with mice, and I do a kind of research called drug discrimination. More on that later. I also teach biopsychology in a number of other courses for the Department of Psychology at VCU. I did not always do this. I came to this rather late in my life, in a non-linear way, to quote Rilke, wandering across and over things. My journey began as an undergrad, like you folks, during the second semester of my sophomore year at St. Mary's Seminary University in Baltimore, Maryland, where I was studying to become a Catholic priest. Well, I took two courses that semester that would forever alter my life. The first was Applied Psychology, Psych 101, and the other was Mammalian Physiology. In the psychology course, I met my first intellectual mentor, Anthony Lobo, whose influence remains with me today. And in physiology, I became captivated by mechanisms and systems, such as circulation, respiration, digestion. But you know, we didn't know much about the brain in those days. Because it was 1846. That's a joke, okay? <laughs> and back then, we didn't have CT scans. I have to get you going. We didn't have CT scans. We didn't have PET scans. We didn't have MRIs. We couldn't peek inside the brain and watch it and study and record it in real time. So other than a couple lectures on the basic nervous system, to me, the brain was still very much a mystery, and I knew nothing about neurons. Still, I was hooked on physiology. Now, I started off as a philosophy major, and I loved it. But during my junior year, I morphed into psychology. My undergraduate degree actually reads Humanities, colon, Behavioral Studies Concentration. Go figure. I think some registrar made that up. Okay. So I graduated in 1973 with a degree half in philosophy and half in psychology with zero real job skills. The future was looking quite unknown. Then I decided also to take the proverbial year off from my pursuit of the priesthood and signed up to do volunteer work in Appalachia where I would sort out what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. I think you guys call them gap years or something like that. So after graduation, I moved back home. Sound familiar? All right. Working that summer, saving money, because I was going to go to Appalachian in September. Then in late August, I got this phone call from a former vocation director who is now pastor of a parish here in the Richmond area. And it seems the parish had an elementary school, and they needed a fifth grade teacher. And he said, I think you would be perfect for the job. I, I just started laughing on the phone. I said, you want me to do what? Teach what? Fifth grade? How old are fifth graders? Whereas I had zero background in education. None. Zippo. Nada. A week later, I'm standing in front of 35 fifth graders. <laughs> wondering what in God's name have I got myself into. I spent three years at it. Most creative years of my life, bar none. I did a master's in education at VCU, then landed another job at a local high school, a hermitage high school, teaching psychology. I didn't even know they taught psychology in high school. So I'm teaching away, still on my year off, and I discovered this program here at the University of Richmond in humanities, where I was able to dig again into philosophy, history, great thinkers, and world religions. And I'm working on it part time, at night, and in the summers, and the last course of the curriculum, 10 graduate courses, the very last one was called Conceptual Development of Modern Science, where I found myself knee deep in the works of Copernicus, Kepler, Newton, Darwin, Heisenberg, Einstein, and the philosophers of science, Karl Popper and Thomas Kuhn. I'm so excited at this world that's unfolding in front of me that at the age of 33, I take an unpaid, listen to me, unpaid sabbatical from my real job, 
and return to a college in Pennsylvania where I take a slew of courses in the natural sciences. I take general biology, human biology, physical geology, concepts of physics, one and two, astronomy. This is geeky stuff, isn't it? Like, who does that? I finish the year, I return from my sabbatical, and I'm back teaching AP psychology. And all is normal. I get married, and my wife, Mary Lee, and I begin raising three children. Then two things happened to change my life again. First was a piece on 60 Minutes in 1996 when Morley Safer interviewed neurologist Oliver Sacks. Sacks is discussing his interesting cases and his runaway bestseller, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. And I am glued to the TV. I am mesmerized, and a fire is ignited inside me. I rush to the bookstore to buy the book and become obsessed with the brain. Second thing that happens, I run across this article in a journal about these new SSRI antidepressant drugs and their activity on the neurotransmitters, such as serotonin. Neurotransmitters? What are they? Serotonin? What's that? What's a synapse? I didn't know about any of this stuff. This was terra incognita to me. So I corner one of my colleagues, a chemistry teacher, and I won't tell you her real name, but it's Cheryl Montgomery. <laughs> and I corner her at lunch, and I ask her a thousand questions over lunch breaks, everything I can think of. What are neurons? What are ions? What do you mean it's a chemical exchange? How does this thing carry a chemical charge? Where's this charge come from? And I'm sure she thought I was possessed. My earlier interest in physiology was returning. So I'm buying every book I can on the brain. Now, you got to remember, this is 1990. I can't Google anything because Al Gore had not yet invented the Internet. <laughs> Older people will get that better than the younger ones. <laughs> I'm reading about all these early neurological pioneers like Paul Broker, Karl Wernick, Charcot, and the great Russians Korsakov and Luria. I'm investigating this link between physiology and psychology, and I'm a mess, a complete mess, and I know it. I'm sure my wife is sick of this stuff. What to do? That's easy. Take a course, right? So in the summer of 1996, I see this course in a summer session catalog at UC called Psych 401, Physiological Psychology. Wow. This is exactly what I'm interested in. I sign up, and it's taught by a Dr. Joseph Porter. It's exactly what I'm interested in. I sign up, and within the, the first day, I buy the book, and within the first 10 minutes, I'm sold. I have this awakening. The world of biopsychology and neuroscience begins to disclose itself to me one class at a time. I don't miss a lecture. I'm hooked. And the next few years, I'm taking classes part-time and in the summers on anything to do with the brain and behavior anywhere I can. Then in 2005, my life changes again. I received this REB award from the Community Foundation here in Richmond for teaching excellence. And it came with a very generous grant, which allowed me to travel and visit renowned neuroscientists just to pick their brain about the brain. I tracked down Oliver Sacks at Washington College, where he's giving a lecture on creativity in the brain. I then go to NYU and meet Dr. Joseph Ledoux, who's doing groundbreaking work on the neural correlates of fear in the amygdala. He gives me an hour of his time, then turns me loose in the lab for an entire day where I peer into electron microscopes and for the very first time in my life see an actual neuron. Do you know how small neurons are? They are smaller than me. <laughs> That's another one. I mean, you can't see them with a naked eye. I'm looking at them for the first time. I found Colin Blakemore, the British scientist known for his work on visual processing at the Society for Neuroscience Conference in Atlanta. I fly to Iowa and I visit Nancy Andreessen at the university who was doing groundbreaking work on neuroimaging techniques of schizophrenia. I meet Marion Diamond, the pioneer of the impact on the environment on an early brain at the American Psychological Convention in San Francisco. I even attend a three-day seminar called The Brain Course which I highly recommend, at Marquette University in Milwaukee, where I'm able to do brain extractions from human cadavers and spend hours dissecting a human brain. Amazing. Then in 2006, Dr. Porter, whom I had befriended now as a fellow neuroscience buddy, pulls me aside and said I ought to apply for the PhD program in biopsychology at VCU. I just started laughing again. I do that when people try to change my life. You, you want me to do what? You want me to do what? <laughs> Go to what? A PhD program? Are you nuts? 
I said, I reminded him, I have a full-time job, a real job. I have a family. I have three children who aren't even out of high school yet. I have a mortgage, and I even have health insurance. In those days, it was truly affordable. <laughs> Joke. <laughs> I was hardly in a position to drop everything and spend five years and going back to school as a full-time graduate student. He said, don't worry about it. Just apply, and we'll talk the psychiatric department into what we can do. And possibly you can work part-time at it till you retire from your teaching gig, and then you can go at it full-time. Well, you know, I guess the stars were aligned in my favor as the department accepted me, although I suspect it was with crossed fingers. But I was on my way. So for the next three years, now I'm still teaching, I take graduate classes one a night and in the summers across the departments of psychology, gerontology, pharmacology, and toxicology. And I'm in heaven. I was able to chip away at many of the program requirements until 2010 when I officially retired from to pursue full-time graduate research at the university. Dr. Porter was so excited when I came into the lab. He said, quick, you can come work with me. And I said, well, what do you do? He goes, I do something called drug discrimination. I said, what's that? And he chuckled, you'll find out. <laughs> and boy, did I ever. He presented me with a drug called amisulpride. There it is that a colleague was interested in investigating using some behavioral assays. Amosopride is an atypical antipsychotic developed by the French for the treatment of schizophrenia and depression. And my research, my research involves asking mice a very subjective question. Can you recognize that you're on amosopride, and can you distinguish that state of mind from the state you experience with similar drugs? Now you try asking that to mice. See what answer you get. Give them amosopride and see if they can tell you that they know they're on it. This is sort of like, there you go, this is sort of like a psychopharmacological taste test. From this, I attempt to discern which neural mechanisms allow the mice to recognize the drug. And five years and counting, the research continues. The mice consistently tell me every day that not only do they recognize amosopride, but that it has a rather unique subjective cue compared to some 30 or now almost 40 different compounds I've tested it against. I've learned the firsthand rigors of detailed, long-term, not so glamorous laboratory experimental research with live animals in a windowless lab in the basement of the Tranny Life Science Building, six days a week with mice who are not good conversationalists and never laugh at my jokes. But with the help of Dr. Porter and my then fellow grad students, Todd Hillhouse and Kevin Webster, we saw the research published in a scientific journal, and I finished my PhD a year ago next week. Now, here's the lesson. Beginning a PhD in biopsychology after a 38 normal career is probably not anybody's idea of retirement plan. But my exploration into biopsychology wasn't a solitary adventure in any way. It was a path over time opened up to me and supported by key mentors, pioneers, researchers, teachers, colleagues, institutions, friends, and family. Each one played a part in that journey. And my path often crossed boundaries between philosophy and psychology and physiology. It has indeed been a journey of widening rings wandering across and over things. And I have no idea where it will take me. But I'm comfortable with the thought that this last ring, as Rilke noted, I doubt I shall ever complete it. So let me close with a question that I posed to Dr. Joseph Ledoux at the end of my interview in his office overlooking the New York skyline. I asked him, I said, Dr. Ledoux, one final question. If everything we do, if everything we think, and everything we say is dependent upon these neural connections in these junctions called synapses, which are really tiny, and where exactly in those synapses is language, is love, or even the knowledge that I know I was born on the island of Guam? And he paused. He sat back for a long moment, and he said... Well, Tim, that's the mystery, isn't it? I want to thank you, and I'd like to thank my mice. <laughs>